We are very pleased that Amanda Ackman accepted our invitation to speak with us tonight. Amanda was born and raised here in Calgary. In high school, she won a Knights of Columbus Respect Life Speech Contest on two different occasions. Since then, she has earned a degree in political science from the University of Calgary, and then went on to get a master's degree from John Paul II Philosophical Studies in Poland. She currently works with a member of parliament on issues of foreign policy, human rights, religious freedom, and respect for life. This year, Amanda set a very lofty personal goal. She is going to blog every day of this year on the subjects of death, dying, our culture, and the meaning in any way that is consistently humanizing and uplifting. Please join me in welcoming Amanda to speak to, to us tonight about her blog, Dying to Meet You. All right, thank you, Paul, for the kind introduction. It's a joy to be here with all of you, and I'm glad you can make it. So how did I come to make this New Year's resolution to blog about death every single day for the year 2021? There are certainly a few reasons, but one of which is certainly that when I was just 18, I had the opportunity to travel on the March of Remembrance and Hope Holocaust study trip to Germany and Poland. And it was on this trip that I traveled with 60 students and two survivors to Germany and Poland and faced up to suffering, evil, questions of morality and mortality. And it was through this experience of facing up really to so many tragic deaths with survivors who still had the capacity to affirm the goodness of the world and the miracle of life, that I thought there was something there, something deep and meaningful and intimate and eminently important about contending with these very difficult topics that are often uh, not seriously engaged. And so it was during that trip that one of the guides said that dehumanization is at the core of genocide. And I thought, if dehumanization is at the core of genocide, then what does it mean to humanize humanity? What is the antidote? With all the ideologies that had an incorrect view of the human person, who was seeking to rescue and recover the right idea of the human person? And that was what led me to John Paul II studies in Poland. So there are a few reasons why I blog about death every day, and I'm three months in, so I'm going to share with you what these three reasons are so far that I think can also serve to enhance and enliven you and your loved ones in your day to day. So these three reasons are encountering people in their depth, discovering the stories that cannot exist without you, and getting some eternal perspective. So now I'd like to unpack each of those points with some stories from the blog posts that I've written, including some interviews that I've conducted, and then we'll have some time for questions if you like. So the first point, for the first point, encountering people in their depth, that kind of connects with this sense of, with the survivors being able to access something about their inner selves, how when they were stripped down to their essentials, they were able to be resilient and uh, tenacious. So against the superficiality of so much of our world and in a social media culture where we usually curate posts that show that are meant to show that we're living our best life and that we ha have a lot of happy moments, we all know that life is filled with suffering and with a lot of hardship and that somehow when we attune ourselves to that, we, we access what is more real about what it means to be a person. And there's something deeply meaningful about that because we know that it's in those moments of vulnerability that we love most deeply. And if you think through your life about the times that have been the most intense in your relationships, I'm sure you'll recognize that it's precisely in moments 
of vulnerability that were probably not the most uh, likely to be on Instagram or Facebook that lend themselves to a sort of encountering the person in depth. So I had the opportunity to interview a reader of the blog named Lisa Wright. And Lisa is a palliative care and hospice nurse in Ontario who was inspired to start a foundation called the Living Wish Foundation. The Living Wish Foundation exists to grant wishes to people who receive a terminal diagnosis and are nearing the end of life. Basically, she found it so difficult. She said, it's the hardest conversation you have to have when you tell someone, when you give a terminal diagnosis and you're signaling to someone, there's nothing else that we can do. She says that when people hear such a diagnosis, they kind of step out of life because they think that there's nothing left to look forward to. So she started the Living Wish Foundation because while there are foundations that provide wishes to younger people, there wasn't one to provide to, to um adults or the elderly the opportunity to have a wish granted. And when she first started this foundation, she told me that she thought it would be very difficult and very expensive to grant wishes, but she was surprised and kind of um, quite moved to learn that people who are nearing death, who are adults, don't wish for 20 people to go to Disney World they wish for a connection. They wish for something that will really bring them their memory and connection with their family and with their loved ones. So she told me a story about a man named Walter and Walter had loved to go for ice cream with his wife. His wife had passed away and his favorite ice cream, rum and raisin was no longer being made. And so through concern about the person, through encountering Walter in his depth, they found out that his wish was to have that ice cream. And it wasn't so much about the ice cream. It was about the depth of his relationships, the nostalgia and bringing him back to those memories that he had had with his wife. So they were able to fulfill the wish by finding someone to manufacture the ice cream that he was craving. And that's just a very beautiful example of what the Living Wish Foundation is doing. And she said that for the, the people who are involved, they really find it very enriching to encounter people who share their lives uh, and really open their lives because they want to be known. They want to be known, not only treated on a, in a medical way, but they want to be known uh, for their story to be heard. And that's what granting wishes does. It gives everyone the opportunity to look forward with them to hope, to fulfilling something that they can do like a day at the beach or the ice cream. Okay, so the second point is the, discovering the stories that cannot exist without you. And on this point, I've got to share that I've read thousands of pages of John Paul II. He's, he's one of my biggest heroes. And of the many pages that I've read, uh, this is my favorite quotation of his. It came from a letter that he wrote to a friend before he was leaving Warsaw. And he said, the great achievement is always to see the values that others don't see and to affirm them. The even greater achievement is to bring out of people the values that would perish without us in the same way we bring our values out in ourselves. So one of the biggest lessons so far from this project has been that so many people have stories, but they don't really think of them as stories until they're drawn out of them. I was having dinner with a friend recently, and this friend works as a doctor and I asked her about her experiences of death and she had some very difficult, tragic stories of uh, deaths. And she told me those stories, uh, but I kept pressing and pressing because I knew that if I, if I tried hard enough, I would be able to find a story that really was uplifting and that was a sort of noble kind of death. And this was on World Down Syndrome Day and which just passed recently. And she told me about a time before she was a doctor when she was working as a live-in assistant working with persons with disabilities. And there was this man named Peter who had a disability and he could only speak 10 words. And he had, because of the kidney issue that he had, he had to have a surgery every six months that replaced a catheter. And so this was a very painful, surgery and there was one particular occasion where she was kind of attending to his needs post-surgery and she had her back to him while she was taking care of some things and she could hear him moaning in discomfort and 
she was concerned. So she turned around and asked him if he was okay. And as soon as she turned around, he gave a big thumbs up and he so stopped moaning and wanted desperately for her to be at ease and for her to know that he was okay. And she was so incredibly touched that this man who could only speak about 10 words and his favorite word she recalled was happy, was so attentive even in his own distress to her and to her having a sense that, that everything was gonna be okay. So she then attended his funeral and was moved because most of the stories of his loved ones, of Peter's loved ones, were stories like that. Stories of people who were um, touched at Peter's regard and at his selflessness. He who was so taken care of really did take care of others. And for those who might, uh, like he really gave a thumbs up to life um, through, through all of his uh, interactions. And so um, that was a story that she hadn't, really recalled and she hadn't even told in full um, and this was 10 years ago so this is an example of bringing out the stories and seeing the stories that others might not see until they're given an opportunity to share uh, I'd probably heard 10 other stories before before I sort of settled on that one being a, a fit for the blog and um, she thanked me for drawing it out of her and many times people are thanking me for giving them the space to not just tell a story but to write a story by the words of their life and to, to see meaning in it. One of my favorite writers, Isaac Dennison, says, all sorrows can be born if you can put them in a story or tell a story about them. And I think that's really true that there are stories that people have within them, but they don't quite know until it can be drawn out of them. And so it's up to you and it's up to us. And it's very pro-life to see the values that others don't see and to affirm them because in this way we bring out the values in ourselves and in others. Okay, so the third point is gaining an eternal perspective. And this one has had a lot of resonance, especially among people my age and especially amidst the pandemic. I'll start with a little story, an anecdote. It's told that there was a student who traveled a long way to seek out a master, a sage. And the student was shocked and aghast to get to the sage's home and see that this person of such great renown lived in a home that was practically bare. All there was was a desk at which the sage would study with the students all day that he would then convert into a simple modest bed when he went to sleep. And so the student was was shocked and, and asked the teacher, where are your chandeliers and couches and stuff? And the teacher being as wise teachers often do, turned the question around to the student and said, well, where's your stuff? And the student said, uh, well, I don't have any stuff because I'm just passing through. And the teacher said, exactly, I am also just passing through. So I love that story about taking a sort of eternal perspective and we're all just passing through. Uh, that was really shared with me in the context of, of the lesson that if death scares you, do eternal things, do the things of eternal significance and ask yourself, what might those things be that reverberate into eternity that echo throughout time? Uh, I've heard it said that we don't take our bank accounts with us when we die. However, what we do take are our charitable tax receipts. And so uh, it's the sense of we carry with us our good deeds. And so hopefully that inspires you all to contribute even more to Calgary Pro-Life knowing that the charitable deeds you do are all that you can really take with you. A story about this. One of the most personally significant blog posts that I kind of teased out throughout the course of this is called How I Will Live After the Pandemic. Now, while I was in Poland, I learned a story about a very incredible person named Janusz Korczak. Janusz was a Polish Jew who was an author, a pedagogue, and an orphanage director. He could have gotten out of the ghetto, out of the Warsaw ghetto, but he was adamant that he would not leave the children of the orphanage. And so he was, in fact, uh, deported with the 200 children to the concentration camp called Treblinka, where he and all the children died. But um, his legacy endures and his willingness to stay with the children um, continues to be sort of a noble thing. 
And he has written many books. Um, a collection of his works is published under the title, How to Love a Child. And I flipped open one of these books and there was an essay or not so much an essay, but a, a letter where he had said, where he was writing about how I will live after the war. And this captured me, how I will live after the war because I thought, okay, there's gonna be something in here about how I will live after COVID. And he started off by saying that the children in the orphanage have begun keeping journals, about 15 of them. But he said, some of the children don't remember what life was like before the war. And so they've stopped writing about the future. Most of them write about the day to day and try to contend with the difficulty of their circumstances. Some of them recall the past if they have memories, but only one boy started writing about the future. And so Janusz says uh, in this context, Eventually, there comes a time where it's good to think about the future. And I thought, this is so true. There are some people who will think, what even was life before COVID? And we'll get in a sort of slump of not even planning or scheming or hoping or dreaming because it seems like it might never end. And for Janusz Korczak, all the questions that he raised about what kind of home would I like? What kind of wife would I like? What kind of... Um, career would I like? He, he, he goes on to ask 30 or 40 questions in the space of this, and yet he didn't manage to do any of them. However, what really hit me was that he asked the questions. He lived looking forward to the future with hope. And so I think eventually there comes a time where it's worth looking forward to the future. And that time is also now. And that whether we are able to fulfill our plans, our dreams, our schemes, our hopes, or not, there's a nobility of taking the eternal perspective that it's worth planning and hoping and dreaming anyway, um, whether, whether we fulfill them or not. It says something about the character of looking forward with hope. So those are three initial insights, lessons that I've come to see through blogging every day at dyingtomeetyou.ca throughout 2021. Again, it's encountering people in their depth, discovering the stories that can't exist without us, and gaining a sense of eternity, living in the light of eternity. So that's a little bit of what I wanted to share with you, and I really welcome your questions. I think we have some time for that. And you can also sign up for a weekly roundup of emails to get all the posts in a kind of weekly digest by clicking Get Enlivening Emails in the drop-down at dyingtomeetyou.ca. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question. Okay. Amanda, when I first heard what you were doing, I thought, how are you going to come up with 365 days of stuff? Give us a perspective on that. Sure. Okay. Well, definitely it's a challenge from time to time. And there are certainly days where I'm writing a post at 1030 or 11 at night. Uh, death is a topic that obviously there's an infinitude of meaning and really an infinite number of topics and angles to explore. Uh, it's not just any topic about death, though. It's topics that are consistently humanizing and uplifting. So that's an added challenge, the question of framing, because I so much believe that as a culture, actually, part of what gave rise to this is I'd grown up, obviously, hearing the phrase culture of death. And based on all the time I spent in, in Europe, and especially in Poland, I started to think, wow, we, we don't even so much have a culture of death, although I understand its original intent, but we really have death without culture. We have too much death in our time without meaning, without ritual, without storytelling, without memory. And so um, I really think that um, part of recovering the philosophy of the human person and, and part of this project is about finding ways, uh, creative ways, sometimes even seemingly tangential ways uh, of restoring culture, broadly speaking. And so themes of loss, themes of grief, it really is much more holistic. And if we look at uh, Christian history, all the books that were about uh, death and dying always had the sort of mention that if you, if you contemplated your death, 
it would enable you to live a more flourishing life. So that's definitely the intent too. And I think that makes the, the realm of possibility even more expansive. Question, uh, Amanda. Mm -hmm. uh, the recent federal government decisions on the assisted death, do you have an opinion on that? Oh, certainly. So in my day-to-day -day work, I'm very involved with uh, this work. And in fact, this project is partly cathartic and therapeutic <laughs> given the work that I do in my uh, day job politically. So I have been very active, uh, thank God, in an office that worked very hard to resist the expansion of euthanasia to persons with mental illness. And our office, our political office, actually produced a short film called Tell Me to Stay, which is a suicide prevention message uh, with a young woman sharing her story, telling a story very compellingly about her struggles with mental illness, with eating disorders, and even some suicide attempts. And she, she shared her story and she said, when I'm in my darkest days, I don't need someone to tell me how to die. I need someone to tell me to stay. And she says in her video that she's the future version. She says, I'm the future of, version of myself who survived to tell you this. So if some people may thank you for making it easier for, for persons with mental illness, for people like us to die, but I'm here to tell you that uh, I'm the future version of myself who survived to tell you this, that, that this is not something that, that is actually desired. So um, yeah, definitely involved in a lot of storytelling uh, in, in politics because it's so important um, that, we, that we get into the reality of, of suffering and of pain and uh, contend with the brokenness and realities of life and affirm that there are affirm a better, more beautiful vision of end-of-life care, end-of-life care that involves palliative care, end-of-life care that involves providing all of the supports and funding, but above all, the culture of family and of community that will make euthanasia unthinkable and, and unattractive. And so that's just a little bit about how I, I navigate the issue, uh, federally speaking. Marina mm -hmm. has a question as well. Mm -hmm. Amanda, I'd like to ask if you, what could you say to young people of your age? Um, how, how can we as adults encourage them to speak about death? Uh, we, we think we're getting closer to it and they can't see it. Because of the challenge, I find that no matter where I go and who I'm with, I'm talking about death, but sometimes you need an excuse to do so. My excuse, I invented a reason to have meaningful conversations about death with others around the project. And so I've got to write a post today. Do you have a story? And it creates an opening. And so maybe, maybe you don't do a, a daily blogging challenge, but maybe you come up with a personal resolution to raise questions. And by challenging yourself, I think you can be really surprised at how receptive people are to the invitation, but it takes that audacity and it takes that matter of sort of resolve to decide it's worth it. Uh, and it's a risk because not everyone immediately wants to talk about it. Or, and some people say, oh, I don't have a story or I don't think I have anything to share that would be a good fit. And then they're surprised and amazed when I 10 minutes later give them a blog post and a link and they're like, wow, that's my story. I never... I, I never knew it was a story. So just, yeah, make a resolution, uh, challenge yourself to raise the questions. And I think you'll be surprised at how receptive people are. So Amanda, how, I know that you received the Calgary Pro-Life presentations, both of them, the You Matter and the fetal development presentations when you were younger. And how do you feel that impacts your life today? Sure. Well, as I, I said in a testimonial before, that seeing the fetal development models was really pivotal for me because I think this was an example of life affirming, positive framing of life issues. It was a way to, to learn something and to face up to something in a very noble kind of way, in a life is beautiful, life is a gift kind of way. And yeah, I just think that it, that creates a sort of receptivity in people's mm -hmm. hearts. And it's also unforgettable. Like when you've, once you've held those little fetal models 
uh, it stays with you and, and you, you think about it when you find out that someone is three months pregnant and, and you can imagine uh, because you held a, a fetal model that size. And so it definitely gave me a cur curiosity from an early age in topics of bioethics, which led me to study um, mm -hmm. Jewish and Catholic thinkers predominantly of the 20th century who recovered, uh, attempted to recover the right understanding of the human person. So yeah, definitely all pieces of the puzzle in uh, getting to where I am now, working with a national uh, efforts uh, working in federal politics to, to humanize the culture uh, legislatively, but we know it's not only a legislative task, it's a, it's a moral and it's a cultural and it's a social project. And that's why I do the blog in addition, um, because there are, there are limits to what we can do in politics, but there's kind of no limit to what we can do in culture and with education. You started answering a question I had I want you to tell us a little bit more about how you do care work. I took the course here at the diocese many years ago, and I think what you're doing is very much needed in palliative care work. So many of us are involved in that. Give us some pointers on what you think we could do better. Sure. Okay. Well, when I was in high school, I remember taking a career test, and the top two results were funeral director and motivational speaker. And I kind of think I'm still figuring out how to combine those, um, which is half a joke and half serious because I really think that there's a morale problem in end of life care. Many people are doing very thankless work that is um, that needs encouragement and that needs the stories to be told about the kind of work being done. And so in addition to palliative care and the advances in medicine and, and what's possible kind of therapeutically and all of that, we really need the, the morale for our end of life care workers. We need to see the values that others don't see and affirm them in this kind of work because in this way we'll humanize our culture. So that's a bit of a different angle, but it very much comes to mind in uh, reflecting on the history of palliative and hospice care. Um, the, the founder, or there's many sort of arguable founders of palliative and hospice care, but one of them is Cicely Saunders in the UK who founded the St. Christopher's Hospice. And she has an amazing story, uh, by the way, a, a, an incredible biography. So I read her book and I actually traveled to St. Christopher's Hospice to kind of trace her footsteps and find out what gave rise to her desire to do this. And yeah, she, she really found that like pain can be managed and that the greatest pain is, is loneliness and, and alienation and, um, definitely at the end of life when someone says, well, I don't know if it's good that I exist. The answer is not, well, neither do I. It's, oh, well, <laughs> and so we, we need to know how to answer those questions that, that are real and deep and existential and powerful. And um, I'm just, I'm so struck by how um, in, my, in my studies in Poland, I, when I returned to do my, my graduate education in Poland, I went and I volunteered uh, to be a guide at a former uh, Nazi concentration camp. And it, it really hit me to learn uh, how few people, even in such dire circumstances, actually chose to commit suicide within the camps. It, there were obviously ways um, to, to that a person could have done so, but they often didn't. And um, so just looking at the different cultural um, tenants there and like what really gives someone the resolve and the resilience and um, most people it's love and uh, we need to know that we're loved we need that ultimate um, as Pope Benedict said like we need to know that it's good we exist and ultimately all human acceptance is fragile so we need people to say with more than words it's good you exist and then ultimately we need to receive that affirmation from God uh, who says, it's good that you be, I want you to be, and uh, live in that truth in order to persevere through all the sufferings and trials of life, because they are a part of it, and we, we need not shy away from it. Uh, part, of, part of what we need is to embrace the mystery of suffering uh, as a culture, and not act like it's something that ought to be excluded um, so urgently and so dramatically. Uh, no, if we enter into it, we'll find that there is um, healing in that, that there's something palliative about um, 
real leaning into um, the, the, the weakness and fragility of the human condition because it, it binds us together in love. Somebody said, I want to thank you for mentioning about gaining eternal perspective, the thought that we are just passing through so that we should do eternal things. It would be very good to help people, especially young, to understand such a thing in a joyful way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's a great standard of uh, like what what really matters. And um, uh, one of the most popular posts, and I, I know this was popular with people in my age group, uh, is titled Take Risks, Not Care, which is something that uh, an Anglican Canon Andrew White is fond of saying he he doesn't sign off and say take care everyone he says take risks and a friend of mine shared with me like a young guy my age and he said I don't know how many risks I've taken not reckless not not imprudent but just risks of life and he was a bit ashamed and it was a bit of a sort of reckoning for him to think what am I doing life is worth the risk and and I ought to to take some risks and so yeah I think gaining a sense of uh, eternal perspective is really key in deciding what's the test of relevance what is going to make my life meaningful um, in the long 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 run uh, and that can somehow and sometimes change your entire educational and professional trajectory to raise those questions because you realize what will pass away and what will endure forever Okay, yes, I think I'll call it to an end. Amanda, I'm gonna take a risk and mention age. Sure. It's really inspiring to see the young people starting to respond the way you are to a world we're turning over, but there's lots of work to be done, obviously. So we really appreciate what you're doing. I think it's got that, what we call the John Paul the second positive flavor to it. So keep up the good work. We're really happy that you're able to come with us. And we will give you a gift when we can do that in the near future. Well, once again, thank you very much. Everyone, let's hear it for Amanda. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. All the best. And yeah, take risks. Take risks and take care. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.